Okay. Gracias. Muchas gracias a todos por acompañarnos en esta plática, que no sería posible sin el apoyo de Tequila 1800. Eh, Sonamaco está feliz de recibir en este panel al señor Jérôme Neutre, director de El Grand Palais, director de estrategia del Grand Palais en París, la señora Tina Kim, fundadora y directora de Tina Kim Gallery, y el señor Dorian Chong, curador principal de M Plus Hong Kong. Thank you so much for being here. La conversación se va a desarrollar en inglés. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Um, so I guess we have about an hour, and then there are three people coming from very different backgrounds and contexts. Um, so before we actually go into talking about the title and the topic, which is the art of collecting, I thought it would be useful for the audience to hear uh, our positions, where we come from, um, because they're quite different, but all related to one another. So I would just start off by saying, as Diego just introduced, in English, my title is uh, Deputy Director for Curatorial and Chief Curator for a new museum being built in Hong Kong called M+, which stands for Museum Plus or More Than a Museum. It's a project initiated by the Hong Kong government, um, but we're not a governmental museum. We're set up as a, a public body or a foundation that's in charge of developing multiple cultural venues. Um, we're actually part of a larger cultural district that would take probably 20, 30 years to fully formed. Um, Anyway, so that the government initiated with a one-time endowment, and we're building according to the mission that was a set, uh, which is uh, M Plus is a museum of visual culture of the 20th and 21st century, that it's rooted in Hong Kong and wider Asia, uh, but with a global purview. So we are collecting contemporary art, but also design and architecture. Um, we also deal with cinema and moving image. And I think it's a safe, to and not so arrogant for me to say that there is no museum like that um, in all of Asia. Um, so there's a lot of attention on this particular museum project. Um, I wish I had brought a, I hope you can all Google M plus Hong Kong later to see that the building has been designed by uh, Herzog and Demeron, uh, the Swiss architect. And it's been under construction for three and a half years. Um, and we are planning to open the museum building in late 2020, so next year. So a project that I have been part of for the last five years. Um, so it will be a total of about seven years for me to open this museum. But in the meantime, we have been organizing temporary exhibitions around town, uh, building a collection. And in order to open this open and operate this museum, which is about 65,000 square meters, that we will need about 350 people working full time. So we are also actively um, recruiting people. So that's where I'm coming from. And maybe I ask Jerome to, yeah, or yeah. Tina. No, you, you go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dorian. So my name is Jérôme Neutre. I'm director of uh, museums in, in Paris and, and curator of art. But I think I was invited here for another aspect of my uh, job, uh, because the title of uh, this forum today is The Art of Collecting, with a focus on collecting Asian art. And it happens that I have been living in India for several years, working for the French government with a special mission to connect Indian art and Indian artists with Europe. Then I was board member of the National Asian Arts Museum of France, the Guimet Museum, which is the largest collect Asian collection out of Asia of art and which was founded in 1888 by a young industrialist named Émile Guimet, who went for a world tour in 1876-1877, went to the Americas, went to Asia, and discovered in Japan, in China, in India, with a visionary uh, ID, a continent with such a complex and rich culture 
that he came back with a lot of art he bought, and he came back with the idea of founding the first Asian art museum in Europe. And I think it's interesting to, to, to talk uh, about that, and Tina also we, will have uh, some things uh, to say. And then also, I'm here, I think, because I curated those last years some shows dedicated not to artists or to a thematic of art, but to collectors. And with the trying to demonstrate that some collectors are like artists. And it's why the art of collecting uh, speaks to me a lot, because when I did uh, uh, those shows about uh, collectors like Yves Saint Laurent, that you may know, of course, or Jacques Doucet, who was a, a visionary and uh, legendary collector in the 1920s, the, the man who discovered and bought the first the Demoiselle d'Avignon by Picasso, for example, the Snake Charmer by Douanier Rousseau. And for me, studying the archives and visiting also the house of Saint Laurent, etc., I discovered that this kind of collector, and I, I met in Mexico with last days also some collectors like this, live with their art, hang their art in a way very personal, and act like curators, in fact, and do some installation work with some correspondences, some dialogues, you know. If Saint Laurent used to say he was a very lonely person, as you know, and he, he used to say that he was speaking to his artworks. So there is a, this uh, uh, dimension of the art of collecting, and I think to be in Zonamaco today, uh, in front, I'm sure, of people who collect or who will collect, maybe, uh, that's very uh, interesting. And Tina, Tina has also a great experience for our topic. Hello, um, my name is Tina Kim. I'm a, a gallerist. I am exhibiting at the fair. Um, I, I guess for me, I have a, a unique experience in a way because I come from a, a gallery a family. Um, my family had a gallery in Korea, which uh, opened in 1983. And this was during the time when Korean economy was blossoming and about the time when we are hosting Olympic. And there was many contemporary art museum um, building their collection. So my family at the time were very responsible for introducing Western art to Korea. We represent many American, European artists in Asia. Um, but me, being second generation and have been um, ed educated in America, I wanted to use my relationship, my contact with um, institutions abroad to introduce Korean art internationally. So my gallery in New York has a special focus in Korean art and broader, but mainly artists who are not represented in New York. So uh, perhaps that's a really good segue to show some images because one um, area that Tina um, has done a lot of work, uh, sometimes in collaboration with her family gallery in Seoul, is around this topic of uh, what's called dansekwa in Korean, which is often translated as a monochrome painting a very important post-war, about 1970s to 1980s. One could even say it even continued into the 1990s of monochrome painting movement. And so I think we can just run it um, automatically. It's a series of exhibitions that um, Tina's gallery or Kukje gallery um, have organized either at the galleries or at the art fairs. So I don't think we want to go through if you can just run it automatically as a slideshow, then you can sort of see the installations and get a sense of the kind of visual languages that I developed. But if I could, and of course, you're an expert too, but I would just start by saying that the, the first group of installation views was, um, from a curator's point of view, really a landmark exhibition that was organized already four years ago, I think of uh, about half a dozen artists um, who are the critical practitioners in this monochrome painting movement that again began in the early 1970s 
all of these artists are now in their early 80s. Um, they were not only the main players in the 1970s, but they also, many of them became educators in major art universities in the 80s and 90s. So they produced a whole generation of artists who came after that. And, you know, as how it happens with art history and of course the following generations learn from them but they also rebel against them as well. So really to be perfectly frank, this kind of art even within Korea was um, for a while kind of forgotten or undervalued. It was seen as a something that's very old school, very establishment until, and, and maybe critically penned in many ways, until this show, along with a couple of other museum shows, brought it back together. What's been really interesting, well, I mean, what's been very fortunate for me as curator working on building a new collection, a new museum, and again, we're situated in Hong Kong, but our mandate is to look broadly across Asia and Asia's connection to the outside world. Um, it was really advantageous to have this kind of show that brought together the most important artists in this movement with the best works that were available. So we were able to acquire a number of, almost actually a dozen paintings um, from this exhibition. It's been really interesting to see from my point of view also how that really seemed to have opened a kind of a if not a floodgate, at least it is a very big door because it is not just a museum like ours that are based in Asia that are paying attention to a painting movement in a little country called Korea, um, but other major Western institutions have also began to uh, really open their eyes to the accomplishment, artistic accomplishment of this movement. So, I mean, I think this is where perhaps Tina can say more, but I do know that our, my curatorial counterparts in major institutions like Tate Modern or Art Institute of Chicago are also clambering to get these works into the collection. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there has been other uh, important uh, international historical exhibitions in New York. For instance, Guggenheim has um, put together Arte Pobara show. Then there was a very important um, Kutai exhibition. Um, and Dorian, at the time, he was at the uh, Museum of Modern Art. And he curated a very important uh, new avant-garde exhibition, which uh, was looking at Japanese post-war um, art. And many curators, they were already traveling to Korea, and they were curious of um, the generation prior to, because everyone was looking for new art, new art, but they wanted to know what was there before, what were these artists fighting against. Um, and, and for, you know, obviously the, the relations with um, Japan and West was much longer and many curators were traveling there before. And because many of Korean artists, their career, their first abroad exhibition was always in Japan, often their names would come up, but they would be put aside because they were not Japanese. So we felt that this would be a good time to put together an exhibition. Um, and we, we were very lucky because Korea, we have a Gwangju Biennale. When Gwangju Biennale is already 20 years old, we celebrated 10th anniversary. Um, and to be honest, as a Korean person, nobody paid attention to Gwangju Biennale. It was happening somewhere far away. Nobody was going there. It was, in my mind, government propaganda. But it brought interesting audience. We, you know, more and more we paid attention. International curators were coming to Korea, and we recognized this is an important time for us to showcase Korean art. And for someone like us, which you know, we have a responsibility because uh, the the family gallery is a destination gallery where all the foreign visitors come. It's not interesting for them to see another 
Bill Viola show, Anisha Kapoor show. Of course, amazing artists that I respect very much, but they have seen those shows abroad. It's not interesting for them to see that same show in Korea. So we thought we were going to put together a historical exhibition that we can educate this amazing colleagues and let them know that many of the Tanseko artists for a long time, they were misunderstood as someone who paints like minimalist artists, the big minimalist movement of America. But in fact, they were fighting against the Western influence. They were already trained as a Western painter, like the, you know, they're the first generation of artists who went to university. They were looking at what was happening in Paris, what was happening in Italy, but they wanted to paint something that was original. And so this movement started as a rejection uh, of all the influence. And I think uh, you have an experience quite interesting, Tina, because you have been promoting Western art, European art in Korea with your mother and your mother first, of course. And uh, at the same time, you have been promoting, of course, Korean art in the Western world and particularly also in Europe. And I think when we had the, the Li Yu Fan exhibition in the castle of Versailles, the garden of Versailles, it was fantastic because again, and I think that's why I wanted to say about this topic collecting Asian art. We are in Mexico today. So to talk about collecting Asian art first, uh, we can remember, and it was my friend, uh, the ambassador of France in Mexico, who was uh, reminding me that in 17th century and 18th century, the art objects from Asia who came to Europe came from through Mexico. It was the root of the Indias, etc., Philippines, etc., China, Mexico, and then, and at that time, the large square where the Socalo is was like the first ever Asian art fair in the Americas, maybe. So it's quite interesting that we talk about this subject, we speak there, here in Mexico, where you have in some old families and houses some precious objects from Asia and in the museums uh, uh, also. Uh, now, that said, I think personally, in my experience, both of uh, living uh, uh, in Asia and curating Asian art, I am deeply, deeply uh, convinced that art is the best way to learn a culture and to experience a country. You know, there was a, our first minister of culture in France with very famous writer, André Malraux, was saying, and he was a great lover of Asian arts and a collector, and he was saying, art is the shortest way from a man to another man. And I think that, for example, my knowledge of Korea is only through Korean art. And I visited Korea, thanks to you, by the way, when I did a, a show with you. But I first experienced Korea through Korean artists and Korean art. And I think that uh, collecting Asian arts is also creating, and it was the, 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 the idea of Emile Guimet in 1888 in Paris, creating a window to Asia in Europe to educate people, because art is to give to see and to give to learn also to people. And I think that it's fantastic that today in our global world, it's one positive aspect of globalization, is that uh, we have more and more exchanges through those biennials, the art fairs, the galleries, like your gallery, you know, uh, 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 acting as bridges between the culture. And, and I always think of this uh, marvelous sentence by the poet Edouard Glissant, saying that cultures change while exchanging. You know, it is through the exchanges, the cultural exchanges, that you can change, develop, uh, enrich some, some, some countries. And, uh, and, and yesterday I visited the, uh, the Rumex uh, Museum 
in Mexico, thanks to the good advice of my friend Maria Ortiz. Thank you. And, uh, and I was uh, happy to see that it was totally uh, in the show a global scene and you had uh, Nam Junpek as well as a French artist, uh, American artist and I think also today in this fair in the Damaco through the, the different booth you have a, a window to the world you know and I think that uh, uh, and I, I was also very you know uh, proud and surprised when I went to have dinner at your mother's house in Seoul that it was full of you had the history of Western art and it was all those works are like ambassadors of their country and, and a way for people to experience deeply, you know, because art is where you have the, the essence of a culture, I think. Don't you think, Dorian? Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree more that art, uh, I guess we choose to be in this business because we share the belief that art is the most effective and profound communication uh, means. Um, but for me, what also makes this question of the art of collecting interesting is that it is always fraught with political relations, right, and power relations. Um, you know, for instance, how Guimet, of course, Musée Guimet is one good example, um, but I'm much more familiar with North American experiences. And United States has many major museums, many of them encyclopedic, including Art Institute of Chicago, I already mentioned, of course, the Metropolitan. And there is also San Francisco Museum of Mar uh, Asian Art that's dedicated to Asian art, which is where I started my career. And all of those stories of collecting, these major, major collections, um, how that happened around the same time in the late 19th century, early 20th century, is very closely related to the fact that China was in political turmoil. So uh, there was a central strong government that could control um, their treasures from leaving the country. So often all of those treasures were collected at very, very low price. Um, I think what's happening, and this isn't really my specialty area anymore, traditional Chinese art, but I do know that for instance, within China now there are two coexisting positions about this. One camp, of course, is, is like the Elgin marble, right? Like if they want it back, like Greece wants it back from the British Museum. Similarly, there is a position that these precious treasures that were taken out in unfair way must return to the homeland. But there is the opposing position that it's good that Chinese artifacts and artworks are out there in the world because as you said exactly, yeah, yeah because yeah. they are the ambassadors. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really the example of more historical collections. Exactly. But I think there is also something really interesting to discuss about more um, late 20th century mm. materials because I, this I, have, I can speak with some authority that um, what, what the images that you have been seeing, you, know, you could call them so-called post-war international styles of painting, you know, abstraction, gestural abstraction being really one of the most dominant artistic art forms that, uh, artistic forms that emerged after World War II. Of course, it's not completely global, but it did reach many parts of the world um, originally coming out of the U.S., but also Western Europe. When I was working at MoMA, um, I was amazed to find out how the Museum of Modern Art was collecting so extensively in this language in the 1960s from all over the world. You go to MoMA now and you don't see paintings from Turkey or Iran or Japan or India, but MoMA was collecting actively all around the world in the 1960s. But then what happened is that they stayed in the storage for the next three decades. And finally, after many decades, that MoMA with the new expansion, and Glenn Lowry was talking here, I think two days ago, I don't know if he touched upon this, but there is a big article in the New York Times where they're saying that we're finally mixing a lot of different mediums you know, paintings and sculptures next to drawings and films and all of these things will finally happen with this new expansion. 
but the museum is now also mentioning that you will also see new faces that have been with our collection for a long time. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that what you are saying about this um, a certain global vision and then exchanges through art within the his, history of contemporary art was also happening right around this exactly. moment, exactly. 60s and 70s. Yeah. I think there was a, yeah. such uh, a comradeship yes. of artists around the world, but yeah. it was actually in the more recent decades that that was forgotten, you know, yeah. and then that somehow, you know, it became Asian art versus Latin American art versus exactly. Western art. Yes. How do we connect them together? Yeah. Actually, you know, it's very interesting, Dorian, what you said about the, the situation in, in America and in New York, because we, we had the same thing uh, uh, in Paris and in France. Uh, very recently, the Pompidou Center re all the collection, and at that time, it was a three, three, four years ago, Catherine Grenier curated the permanent collections with a new title called Modernité Plurielle, like plural modernities. And the plurality was a geographic plurality. And in fact, they discovered, well, they discovered, they do, but the audience discovered that in the French national collection, we had all the significant Asian arts to count this story. But as you said, they will, before, they would only present that through a special, almost ethnic window about a show about Indian art, a show about China's art, etc., and not taken in a, in, a, in a global way. And I think that today, as you said very truly, uh, it is also, I think, those institutions, for me, for my opinion, but I would like to, to share that with you, are sometimes, you know, the institutions are, are late. And for me, the market, the collectors coming back, the curators pushed the museum to do that. Because finally, I was talking about Emile Guimet, end of 19th century. There was, he launched the, the fashion of the Japonism, for example, with this standard. And a lot of collectors, like Clémence Denry also, a lot of people in France and, and around. It's why you have three Asian Arts Museums in France, two in Paris, one in Toulon, one in Nice. A lot of people collected. Then after, less. Then after in the 60s, 70s. Then after, forgotten. Then in the last decade, there were many people who, thanks also to all the, the exchanges, the, 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 the economics exchanges, the political exchanges with those countries, of Ajoa between the continents, collected more art. And then the institution realized that the house of the collectors were universal museums in a way while our said universal museums were self-centered uh, uh, museums. And for example, Pompidou was a really uh, an history of uh, Western art, you know, and not of a world seen for decades. And what you said for MoMA is, is the same. And I think it's interesting, again, the art of collecting. is like coming back to those uh, collectors I was mentioning, like Yves Saint Laurent, who, or Jacques Doucet in the 1920s. Jacques Doucet bought Les Demoiselles d'Avignon by Picasso and several other masterpieces, bought Brancusi, bought Douanier Rousseau, and gifted to the state after. And the state national collection, French state, refused the Demoiselles d'Avignon because it was not enough good for them. And that's and, how we ended and, up and, in and MoMA. That's why it is at yeah. MoMA today. And we are uh, uh, very big. And they refused the Snake Charmer by Douanier Rousseau during seven years. Finally, they took it. And, and you know, sometimes collectors, because they, they have a, another view, you know, it's normal heritage curators and museums are like historians. So they are, you know, they need some distance with, 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 the, with the news and with the, 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 the present time. And I think the gallerists, the curators, and the collectors are a little bit the, the oil in the machine, you know? They, they give the energy. They launched the, the tendencies, and uh, and for the collection of Asian art, it's it's really uh, it's really. Well. Did you see that also, Tina, in your job? Because you have something you can speak about the the attraction of Western people for the Asian art. Um, 
I mean, I think, you know, as Jerome said, art is the true ambassador. And when, um, I think when a, 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 you know, conscious person travel to any country, they would be curious about visiting the museum and historical places or making friends and visiting their home. And when you do visit the, the you know, host home at any different country, the one stands out the most is the one who supports the artists of the region. At least that was my case when I have traveled with many museum groups to, you know, I came here to Mexico or I came to, I went to Brazil or I went to Scandinavian countries and I was so impressed to see some of the collectors who have so passionately supported their artists. And this was a great lesson for us, for someone who have for many years supported building Western art collection in Korea. I felt, oh wow, there's something that I have to do. I, I feel responsible with all the friendships that I have built internationally. The, I think, you know, I have built my um, a credibility and now it's time for me to introduce Korean art abroad. And I think, especially for Mexican audience, the audience here, the, the contemporary artists are very conscious about social, political situation, which was very similar in Korea. And still now, many young Korean artists are uh, conscious about the responsibility of establishment and government. And I feel that there's a natural dialogue between our culture. And, and I think it's very interesting for me to talk about what was happening in Korea in the 70s. Just thinking that I couldn't agree more um, that I think, Jerome, you were just calling <clears throat> collectors and galleries as a sort of, um, they oil the machine, you know, before these uh, collections of museums um, get formed uh, because, you know, museums by definition are more bureaucratic, we're slower, there are more stakeholders that you have to please and, you know, it's a highly political um, job versus, you know, collectors can have much more sort of subjective and much more quick response um, to it. And then we also get really um, a, inspired by the often quirkiness of private collections as well. But I will go so far as to say that, um, especially in the contemporary business, that what collectors and definitely galleries are doing are that they are the avant-garde, right? Like they are the front line um, and then we can sort of, museum people can step back a little bit and then see until the dust has settled a little bit so that we can come in more comfortably. Um, so, you know, that also reminds me of, of, of course, a very, very example that's, uh, that has happened to my museum at M Plus is that our collection, which we've been building only about now seven years or so, um, but we have all, about 6,000 artworks and objects and also we're building an archival collection, mostly architecture, that's numbering above 20,000 at this point. So we've been collecting very, very um, rigorously, but also very quickly. And, but the very beginning of the collection was formed by a, a donation by a private collector named uh, Dr. Uli Sig. Um, and he gave us 1,510 works of Chinese art. Um, the we, we, we have just to say, he, he was the Swiss ambassador. Yeah, I was to, about to, to say. To, he was a yeah. foreigner, a European, yeah. collecting yeah. Asian art in a very visionary way. Again. That's exactly right. No, so, nobody was so I wanted to describe who he is a little bit. So, you know, he's not just a rich person who said, oh, I've got this collection, I'm going to just give it to you, that he actually, before he was the ambassador, he went to China in 1979. This is three years after the Cultural Revolution to start the first joint venture with the Chinese government because he was at the time working for the Schindler Company, the elevator and escalator manufacturer. So he started the first joint venture. I mean, at this point, Probably in that big country of China, there were less than 100 foreigners in the whole country. Now it is a totally different story. Then he went back in the early 90s as the Swiss ambassador um, 
and I guess because of Swiss is, Switzerland is a small company, he wasn't just ambassador for China, he was also ambassador for Mongolia and North Korea. So he had a very big job. And then that's when he opened his eyes to the incredible creativity of the first generation of contemporary Chinese artists. And you really have to realize that during the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 76, China was sh basically shut off from the rest of the world. Um, and you could only practice socialist realism as an artist. Um, and right after the end of the revolution, people started getting more and more information. You still couldn't see contemporary art from different parts of the world in flesh. So you could get just reproductions, black and white reproductions to educate themselves. So they had to practice from impressionism to expressionism to Dada, surrealism, all of these styles within 10 years. They were basically taking a crash course on modern and contemporary art history from 1870s to 1970s in 10 years. That's what created this very interesting language of Chinese contemporary art. So when Uli Sik went to China in early 1990s and saw what the artists were doing, many professionals would see that as, oh, this is derivative. You know, this is just a second rate. But then what he could see was that this is the artist making up time, but also having a totally different lens into the world history. So there's that he recognized that this first generation of Chinese contemporary artists are saying that that mostly Western, mostly French, some British, some American art history is not foreign, it's not Western. That's ours as well, you know, and then we're going to make it into our own. That's what he recognized. But I think it's very interesting what you said, because when we, 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 we could say, you could ask, why specific, specifically talking about collecting Asian art? Because as you know, as you see, even uh, visiting the fair, there is, we could say there is a, a fashion or a tendency, you know, in collecting Asian art, and specifically, Chinese art, the last decade. But why? Not especially because China is uh, becoming an economic uh, giant country, but because there is, according to me, a fantastic creativity. There was, it was the place where there was such a creativity. You know, in the art history, you have a, sometimes a decade or a movement with a huge creativity in some place, in one country. And then after, it goes down, then it comes back. You know, it was the, the fact we could say that Paris in the 1920s was really the world capital for the arts. Then after, it was a little bit, then after it came back, uh, during the Arte Povera, Italy was really uh, a place with such a huge creativity. After, it was a little bit uh, more, more quiet. And I think that the last decade, as you said, Chinese art, because, and you explained it for me, it's really the great explanation you have done, uh, Dorian. It explains why there is such a creativity and so, logically, an attraction from the collectors. And after Uli Sieg, there was uh, Guy Hulens, for example, a uh, Belgian who, who, uh, collector uh, who created the uh, uh, museum also in, in Beijing and collected a lot. Uh, even more recently, Dominique et Sylvain Lévy, etc. You had a lot of people focusing because also curators, galleries were, were saying there is there like a, an Eldorado of, of contemporary art because of, of that movement, I, I think. And I mean, I think then also it also had ripple effects. Um, so this whole boom of contemporary Chinese art began to happen in the early 2000s, really. And I really think that that what well, there was already interest in Japanese art for many years, of course, but then that had gone down a bit. Then then China emerged as you know the Western collectors, but also regional collectors were looking at China. But I think it had ripple effects in a sense that that also made collectors from other parts of the world start looking at say Korea. You know what's been happening? Here? Don't you think so, Tina? Yeah. No, I think this. Um 
um, international interest in not only one region but broader region. I think you know China was hugely interesting, Japan, Korea, then it's continuing now. A lot of people are looking at what's happening in Southeast Asia. There's still so much to be discovered, and each country have their own aesthetic, but I think it's not only to look at one region, but how it connects, how they have digested the influence uh, at the time, because every part of the country had somewhat colonial experience. Some resisted one way, the other another way. And it's, it's interesting to connect the dot. I mean, it's interesting for me to go see Turkey, to see um, what's hap- you know, Lebanon, and how Asian culture connects there. And, you know, maybe that um, influence happened much earlier on, but it's a, I think it's a cycle. Yeah. Don't you think that this period in Korea was the peak period for the, the history of modern and contemporary art in Korea? Don't you think that it was the, the climax? No, you won't I, say I, that? I, I think it's the first generation of artists who were very socially, politically conscious who were fighting against the establishment. At the time, Korea was going through a very strong economic growth, a huge um, vast industrialization, and we had a strong military government and, and censorship that you could not imagine. I mean, it's just a recent history in 1980s. We had a massacre that killed thousands of students and all was covered. The censorship was so strong that it was not broadcasted. And there was no way for elites to discuss because they were threatened for their position. And um, of course, many students were demonstrating. And at the time, many of the artists were um, teachers but uh, they couldn't participate on the protest because they would lose their job. Not only they would lose their job, they would be called communist, and they would lose their position in the society. So for me, it wasn't just about their artistic practice, but it was their social conscious, uh, the responsibility, um, but in a very quiet way. You know, they, they, they called it silent protest. They couldn't really take part. And for that reason, they were for a long time not respected by the next generation artists. They were the, um, conflu- what do you call it? The, you are, you, you, yeah, they, they were part of the establishment. And, and so for, for many younger artists that we represented at the time, they were very upset for what we were doing, that this was wrong, that they were the part of the establishment, but they did what they could in their own way. Maybe we should hear what the audience uh, want to share, maybe. Uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, in the audience if someone could speak about the, the art collection of Asian art in Mexico. Is there collection of Asian arts in, in Mexico uh, is the tendency also in Mexico. Oh. Yeah. La señora. Hello. <laughs> well, I'm not pr- pretty sure about um, a special collection here in Mexico about the Asian art. I mean, it's not like the, the traditional thing. It's difficult to find. It's sometimes maybe a um, collection that comes for, la- for a time and then lips. But I've been, I'm, I, I have seen more Asian art in New York, for example, that, than here in my country. And it's interesting to me what you have said about the uh, collections because, yeah, it's culture, it's, it's the way, I mean, art, it's the way to, to meet a culture closer. But I was thinking about what you said. It, it's interesting to me to think about now the globalization and all that stuff because now in this fair, for example, we see a lot of works from all over, all over the world, but it's contemporary art and it's quite similar all around the world. It's this globalization. So how can you uh, make a point of the departure from a culture, 
uh, essence when there is so much globalization. Because if I see one stand and then I went to another, and one is from Italy and the artists are from Italy and then you cross to the next one and they are coming uh, from some yeah. other country. But the tendency is the same, that, you know, the ten, the trendy, uh, what is trendy, it's the same all, or, all around. So I don't find a different uh, culture. <laughs> actually, you, you raise a very interesting point because today we mentioned the Biennales and you have uh, 150 Biennales, as I don't know. And, and today an artist has no borders, you know, has no, a, a, an artist is very nomadic, you know, the, the artists are traveling all over the world through uh, mini global planets, the art fairs or the biennales are. And so you, you raise a question. We are in a, in a time where everything at is the different. end of the day, we are arriving to, very to, to one culture to, to, to guess <laughs> What is, this, what is the citizenship yeah, what of is the origin the of the contemporary artist? From because, Brazil for example, or from I'm China. an artist as well. I'm a painter, and I've been doing a lot of expositions here in my country, but I haven't been abroad. But uh, if in such case, if I do something that represents my culture, my country, I wouldn't be maybe in the te in the trend. You you understand me? I would do something quite different, because that now the contemporary art it, it's I mean too global. <laughs> you no, know? But, but don't you think that in a sense a good work of art yes has a it universal dimension? I think for me it has always been a parameter to to qualify a masterpiece. And yes. For example, I remember Liu Fan in Versailles again. Liu Fan is 100% Korean, but 100% universal. And I think great artists are the artists who are from yeah, nowhere okay. and everywhere. Who, I understand your point. Who speaks to the, to the deep spirit and soul of the, of the humankind, don't you think, Dorian? So that's something that it's a, a deeper language because it's something from the inside of the person, the inner part of the person. So maybe that's the globalization culture that you're talking about. Maybe. You know, I would respond by saying that um, you're right to the extent that there have been certain flattening or homogenization that has happened. I mean, I think that's un, um, unavoidable, perhaps. But I was saying that that's not just recent phenomenon. Like that time when those artists were studying in the 60s and 70s, they were all trying to practice this international style of abstraction. You know, again, I think it is important for me at least to think that that's not trying to just follow the trend or trying to, you know, jump on the bandwagon of a Western style, but that's basically saying that I, I'm going to take my membership in that club. You know, I'm going to be the legitimate member of this international community who wants to practice the most experimental form of art. You know, that's how I see it. And I think it is a similar also with why we're seeing this global contemporary styles. And sometimes you can't tell whether it's from Ecuador or from Thailand. You know, they all are using certain kinds of languages. But I do think the more successful and the best examples of contemporary art may use that con global or international style language or format, but it always, it never forgets where it's coming from, you know? And I've been thinking about this a lot um, by being here, because I love coming to Mexico, but I haven't been here for a while. And I was just trying to think, what do I like about being in Mexico? Because it's, a, you know, it has a very strong visual and material culture that's clearly different from other places. It's a very characteristic place. Um, and even starting from the fair here, like, you know, I wouldn't be interested in coming to Zona Marco if I was exactly seeing the same thing. So I agree with you to the extent that a lot of it is the same, but this fair feels different than fair in Hong Kong. You know, there are regional differences. Uh, that definitely happens. Um, and I think Mexico is an interesting context for people from Asia as well because it has a, such a long history, at least going back to the 1920s, of how you can participate in the international language, but then make it 
um, indigenous. I mean, that's what you get starting from muralism, right? From Diego Rivera to, you know, go c continuing. And not all countries successfully do that. You may start from cubism, but you make it into your own avant-garde movement. And then Mexico is a, one of the most successful and most long-lasting examples of that. So for me, it is really because sort of my main topic now is China or the surrounding regions of the last 50 years. It's very instructive to see how Mexican modernism has successfully accomplished the um, being both international but both native at the same time. I totally agree with you, Doria. Uh, an artist remains also rooted in, in, in a certain culture. Right now, I am curating uh, this month of February in the Archaeological Museum of Naples in Italy and in Pompeii, a show made with a Chinese artist, Chai Kyo Kyung, and with a Chinese artist living in New York, so totally, in a way, in the global world, who was presented at the Guggenheim, uh, New York, Guggenheim, Bibao, etc. But I can tell you that all those last years I've been working with him, not only he's only speaking Chinese, that's another thing, but he's deeply rooted in a Chinese art history, mixed, in the best sense uh, of the term, mixed with a knowledge, an incredible knowledge, of both the classic Western art and the contemporary art scene. And I think, uh, you know, all the history, you know, who, who, who is an artist? It's like coming back to Malraux. Uh, Malraux saying, was saying, an artist is not someone who is admiring the sunset. Uh, 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 an artist is someone who is admiring Caravage and all the history of the art, etc. Coming after artist and before artist. And the artist, no other artist. You know, Brancusi, when he was trained uh, in Paris in 1904, he was going everywhere to the Guimet Museum to observe the, the classic sculpture of Asia. And thanks to that, he made this fusion and created and invented, in a way, the modern sculpture. So you have those exchanges. Again, art is a question of exchange, no? Yeah. And I think that's a good place to end. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Ah, art is a it's most beautiful, beautiful language. language. Thank Let's you, end right there. This is the, yeah. the, the word of the conclusion. Great. Thank, Thank you, everybody. For the Thank you for spending the Thank hour you. with us. Bye Thank bye. you. Thank you.